So welcome to today's Interspecies Conversations lecture. I'm Kate Armstrong, I head programming for Interspecies Internet, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all on behalf of the trustees and our organization to this lecture, which is part of regular online talks and workshop series that gives the opportunity to invite leading professors, scientists and researchers to share their work with um, others, to contribute to advancing the acceleration and understanding of the diversity, forms and functions of communication with other species. So today we will hear from Earth Species Project, AI to unlock interspecies communication. And we're joined by Katie Zakarian and Sarah Keane. So the exponential developments we are seeing in the field of AI and in particular, large language models such as GPT-4 offer the potential to transform our world. Earth Species Project is a non-profit non research lab focused on using the power of AI to decode non-human communication. From beluga whales to zebra finches, the ESP team is working closely with scientists to build machine learning models that will advance our ability to find patterns and meaning in the communications of other species, with the ultimate goal of transforming our relationship with the rest of nature. So ESP joined our talks back in 2020. This time we are joined by CEO, Katie Zakarian and senior AI research scientist, Sarah King. They will explore some of the latest developments in AI, unpack key steps on the ESP's technical roadmap towards decode and delve into some of the successes and ongoing challenges inherent to using these technologies to expand our understanding of the non-human world. So I will pass it now to Katie and Sarah. Hi there, thank you so much. I'm gonna start sharing my screen. Okay, can you all see this first slide? Perfect. All right. First off, thank you so much interspecies community, interspecies IO. It is awesome to be back and um, I love this lecture series. I really enjoy it. So to be participating in it again is a lot of fun. And I hope that people walk away learning as much as I have from the speakers um, that you all have had in the last uh, years. So thank you. Um, today, we're going to talk about sort of what's happening in machine learning, sort of set the stage of what's been going on the last couple of years to provide some context for the case studies that my colleague Sarah is gonna present about how we apply machine learning to non-human signals. And we're also gonna to talk to the ethologists, the naturalists in the audience about ways to get started with machine learning. Um, so briefly, I'm, I'm one of the co-founders of Earth Species Project, a nonprofit organization. The organization was ideated and developed by my co-founders, Aza Raskin and Britt Selvatel, and launched in 2017. The concept for this, uh, this, this organization goes way back to the early aughts, when Aza was an undergrad at the University of Chicago, but that's a completely different story for a different time. But prior to Earth Species Project, I had been working on developing animal-born sensors, remote sensing technologies, um, and data collection methods. And I collaborated closely with wildlife biologists, wildlife veterinarians, park rangers, those on the front lines of biodiversity conservation. And in that work, I learned that policy and technology solutions can sometimes have small limitations with very big implications. And that developing the ability to listen and learn at very fine detail, yet at huge scale, could be one of the most important problems that we technologists could help solve. And then every once in a while, you meet extraordinary people doing extraordinary work. And so in 2019, when I met 
Britt and Aza, my co-founders, it felt like opening up a clamshell and discovering pearls. You know, here were two very big minds thinking about how they could harness their expertise in the development of new technologies and artificial intelligence research to address an extremely big challenge, which was interspecies communication and a deepening of our understanding of our co-species on earth. And given my experience, it was immediately apparent to me how machine learning could support field biologists, wildlife veterinarians, park rangers, in accelerating the manual process of data analysis. And as a technologist, I couldn't imagine a more impactful way that I could support scientists, biodiversity, conservation, planetary health. And moreover, you know, within our species, every major challenge we've ever solved, we've done so with collaboration and communication. And the giant ones facing us like climate change will only be solved with communication. Indeed, those who profit from denying so invest massively in communication. So what we see as the solution of, you know, to the next order of giant problems will eventually be the power to communicate beyond our current capabilities, beyond maybe even our current species. And so this earth shot, as we call it, that we're aiming for at Earth Species Project is for machine learning to decode non-human communication. And then that new knowledge and understanding that results from that would reset our relationship with the rest of nature. And you know, this is a, to me a com really compelling as a potential unlock in addressing the biodiversity and climate crisis that we're facing to help us find new ways to coexist on the planet with other species. So back in October of 2020, when we met with you all, um, we were talking about our current approach, our technological roadmap. And uh, one of our researchers, Peter Vermont, presented uh, his approach to the cocktail party problem or what uh, we call also uh, signal separation, um, which was later published in, uh, in one of the nature publications. Um, but a lot has happened since then. <laughs> you know, the field of artificial intelligence is advancing so quickly. Organizations like ours focused on machine learning research. It requires that we remain very agile and opportunistic and to constantly be reassessing of what's possible and understandable to our collaborators, our supporters, and be able to integrate new techniques into our roadmap. You know, in the last years, there's been the, the advent of many technologies, but one thing that's sort of been a breakthrough is the productization of large foundation models, which many of you might know also as chat GPT. And, you know, I, I just, instead of going into the technicality of, of how it works, I just wanna just instead show you what I did prior to this, uh, this uh, presentation. I asked chat GPT, hey, can you write a song for me about the benefits of machine learning to ethology research in the style of Peter Gabriel? Um, and this is what it created. Um, and why this is interesting is that this model is able to preserve the concept of song. It's able to preserve the sentiment, it's able to understand sentiment and bring that across in what it's giving back. And also it can understand the concept of style. And I'm sure a lot of you, if you're um, you know, in academia, you're grappling with the advent of new technologies as educators. Um, and for many of us, we've been playing with this. It had over 1 million users in one month. It's one of the fastest growing applications. And I think today I saw a stat, it uh, has 60 million you know, monthly users. So large foundation models, this work that had once been relegated to academia in machine learning research is now kind of out front and center. Um, and then this other sort of development also happened in the last couple of years is clip models. Um, and this enables us to do predictive modeling across domains. Um, what do I mean by that? It means that you can understand and provide the model information in one modality and it can essentially translate it into another. 
And so this example here is I put into an application called Midjourney, give me an image based off of text. And the text was interspecies internet. And this is what it was able to give me back. Um, and you can do this with any modality, be it music, text, images, fMRIs, and maybe also animal signals. And so the, what is the opportunity for ethologists in the advent of these machine learning breakthroughs? Now, at this moment, I'm gonna pass it over to Sarah Keane, one of our senior AI research scientists, to talk through some of the case studies with our work to date with ethologists and behavioral neuroscientists to talk about these opportunities. Thank you so much, Katie. Uh, so I joined ESP this spring after working in academia for several years doing field and lab-based research, studying bioacoustics and focusing on animal communication, mostly birdsong. And I was drawn to this organization because I'm very hopeful that machine learning is going to help us to discover patterns and animal signals that we couldn't previously detect. And I truly think it will change our understanding of animal communication. So I'm going to tell you about some of our ongoing projects and collaborations. And in all of this work, uh, ESP's approach is aiming to mirror that of the broader machine learning community. So we are trying specifically to methodically establish foundational components like data sets and tools that are going to help researchers to transform this area, much like the other realms that Katie was just talking about. So one of the first pieces of our machine learning toolkit is uh, benchmark data sets. So a benchmark is an open available data set that anyone in the public can use. And it serves to give us a way to compare the performance of different machine learning models. And these have been really key in advancing the field of machine learning within the last 10 to 15 years, um, particularly in image recognition and human speech recognition. So the logos on the left here, you might be familiar with these benchmarks. ImageNet, it's a collection of millions of annotated photos um, that has helped us to have the image recognition we now have in Google today. And then there's also AudioSet, which is manually labeled audio recordings. And having this available to train machine learning models has um, facilitated the software that's running on all of our phones now that helps with speech recognition. So usually when you see a benchmark data set published, it'll be accompanied by a leaderboard like we see in the lower right corner here. And this is just comparing the performance of different machine learning models like ResNet and looking at the accuracy and precision of each model and its ability to do a classification task on this labeled data. So in um, bioacoustics, um, a lot of the methods that are developed due to limitations on our uh, data collection abilities, they tend to focus on a smaller number of species or maybe a specific type of methodology. But to get the generalizable tools that uh, we already have in say image recognition, we need big diverse test data sets. So some of our senior research scientists shown in the photos on the left here have created what we're calling beans. And this is a benchmark of animal sounds. And it's a collection of audio recordings from more than 250 species. And um, this large aggregate data set is um, a way to test tools for classification and detection. And these are outstanding problems in bioacoustics that uh, we desperately need solutions to. And in the publication of this benchmark data set, our research team has gone ahead and run some of the most popular machine learning models on the aggregate data. And in the table on the lower right, you can see the performance. And so this is giving us levels, uh, baseline levels of accuracy and precision against which we can measure our progress. And that's really what we're hoping the benchmark will be, is a proxy for progress in this field. And so we know that animal communication is multimodal as well. And we want to encourage the analysis of other data types beyond just audio recordings. 
So for that reason, two of our senior researchers, Benjamin Hoffman and Maddie Cusimano, have also developed a biologger benchmark data set. And so a biologger is an animal born tag like the one in the image on the right here. And uh, these produce very valuable data because they can um, inform us about animal ecophysiology and allow us to improve conservation by monitoring animal movements and behaviors with very high resolution. Um, unfortunately, <clears throat> in analyzing biologger data, we suffer from the same problems. We don't have a common benchmark against which to compare the merits of each machine learning technique. So um, Ben and Maddie have worked with many collaborators from other universities to publish this uh, recent paper that has the benchmark data set. Um, and it includes audio or biologger recordings from nine different taxa. Um, and within the paper, we not only include the data set, but we also provide a framework, so a set of guidelines for evaluating machine learning models on these types of data and a code package that will automatically run the analysis for you. And so again, we're hoping that this facilitates progress within the field by equipping researchers with the tools they need to iterate upon and improve methods in a standardized way. And another thing that we're doing to advance the broader field of machine learning and bioacoustics is building foundation models, uh, which Katie mentioned a moment ago. So a foundation model is a very large neural network that has been trained on huge amounts of data. And these models can perform different tasks without being explicitly trained to do so. And <clears throat> that's what makes them so powerful. So for example, ChatGTP can generate language um, in the form of Peter Gabriel song lyrics or answering questions um, or writing an essay for an exam. Um, so we have built the first and only foundation model for bioacoustics. Um, Masato Hagiwara, one of our senior researchers, has named it Aves, and it has been trained with 5,000 hours of sound that include vocalizations from many different taxa. And the framework is uh, an encoder-based audio representation model. So basically what that means is we can put in recordings of animal signals and the model will output a learned representation of each signal that's basically a simplified vector of measurements. And in the publication that we have on our GitHub page, Masato has compared the performance of this model to some of the other top-line machine learning models. And we're finding that in many cases, ADs is outperforming existing models. So we're hoping to continue to iterate upon this and to build more models. And as we're continuing to build this machine learning toolkit, we've also begun to analyze animal data and work with other researchers. Um, so one of the projects that we've taken on within the last year is studying vocal signaling in beluga whales. And to do this, we're working with collaborators at the University of Windsor, uh, specifically a doctoral student, Jacqueline Aubin. And she is focused on the St. Lawrence River beluga population, which is highly endangered, and despite decades after a hunting ban have passed, um, this population has failed to recover. And that's because their recovery is being threatened by high levels of underwater noise, by contaminants in the water, and limitations on prey availability. So our collaborators are hoping to study the vocal behavior and social structure of the population with the goal of designing better conservation approaches. So for this work, we have been specifically focused on contact calls, which are vocalizations that individuals make to maintain group cohesion or stay near to one another. They're often used so mothers and calves can find one another um, within a pod. And this is similar to other dolphin species that um, use calls in similar contexts. And what is thought is that Belugas with closer social associations will have more similar contact call structure. 
And so what that means is that we can actually measure the calls and get an idea of the relationships within this population. And in the lower left corner here, there's a picture of a spectrogram that shows what these contact calls look like for different examples. And um, unlike other dolphin species, they have a very complex structure. So they have tonal components as well as these broadband clicks. So this is a unique problem uh, to be solved to analyze the differences in these calls. So I have been <clears throat> working with these researchers to do an analysis of how similar the call structure is throughout the St. Lawrence River population. And I took focal recordings of belugas um, that were manually labeled by our collaborator, Jacqueline. And she classified all of these 1800 calls into six different classes. And I analyzed these calls with our foundation model, AVs. And from the output of that model, I was able to assess similarity between all of the calls in this data set. And I've made a 3D plot of the results of that that's shown on the right here. And so in this point cloud, um, each of the individual points represents a single beluga call. And I've projected this into 3D space and it's rotating so we can see the results better. But points that are closer to one another within this projection are calls that have more of a similar structure as assessed by our model. And the colors of each of these points are the labels that were manually assigned by our research collaborators. So the fact that these similarly colored points are next to one another in this projection means that our model is matching the predictions of human experts. So this is hopefully going to tell us two things. Um, first, our model can do the same analysis uh, that a human can do, hopefully with high precision. And we could use these tools to then accelerate the progress of research by automating some of the analysis that needed to be uh, that needs to be manual at this point. Um, and then number two, on the next slide, we think that we can then infer population structure based on the similarity of these calls. And that's important because even though all of the belugas that we're studying are in the St. Lawrence River, we um, the researchers suspect there might be sympatric populations. So populations that overlap in geographic space that are socially distinct from one another. And that's important to understand because we can better assess the degree of human impact on the belugas and know what units we're working with in terms of different populations within the same region. Um, to give one other example of an ongoing collaboration, we are also working with some researchers in Spain at the University of Leon, Vittorio Baglioni and Daniela Canestrari to study Spanish carrion crows. And um, so this is a different ecological question that we're hoping to answer here. We are aiming to link vocal signals with behaviors. And we chose this species because uh, they're very ecologically interesting because these carrion crows are cooperative breeders. So that means that instead of a single pair of birds building a nest and raising their offspring, just the two of them, these uh, carrion crows often live in communal groups with up to nine birds, and they work together to raise each other's offspring. They help each other find food and fight off predators. And it's thought that perhaps some sort of vocal signal or body stance or other communication signal might be facilitating these cooperative behaviors. So researchers have outfitted the crows with these wearable biologgers. There's an, an image of one here on the right, and they have many different sensors. We're focused on the microphone recording audio and the accelerometer that's recording the body movements of the birds. And so we want to use the data from these two modalities to get at this question of whether particular calls correspond to specific behaviors. So we have a few different ESP researchers that have been collaborating uh, with the University of Lyon, Maddie and Jinyu and Benjamin. And they're hoping to design one of these clip models that Katie mentioned earlier, where we're able to translate between modalities. So for example, uh, looking at the top right plot, given this motion, and this is a uh, 
3D rendering from an accelerometer of the path of animal motion. Uh, given that movement path, can we predict what sound is being produced at the same time? So can we generate predictions with a high level of accuracy? And so to approach this, uh, the ESP science team has developed models that can encode both the audio streams and the accelerometer streams and create different classes of um, either vocal signals or categories of movement. And then we're hoping to create mappings between movement and audio uh, so that we can have these accurate predictions. And this is an ongoing project. Um, our researchers meet with the University of Lyon every few months and uh, data is continuing to be collected and the research team goes back and iterates and improves upon the model and, and then regroups at, as we keep building on our understanding and expanding our work. So this is currently in progress, so stay tuned for results. And um, one last example that I'd like to give of some of our ongoing work is uh, very fun. We're using generative models to conduct interactive playbacks with other species. And so a generative model is a neural network that has been trained on a large number of examples. So for example, recording of speech, and it can create novel synthetic samples that resemble the training data, but are unique and differentiated from it in some way. So this is already happening with human speech and it's best illustrated through an example. Um, I'm going to play an audio clip that has a generative model that was trained on human speech. And it will start by playing a little bit of the prompt of the training data that was used to build the model. And then it will continue in a voice that is um, telling us or using the synthetic sounds that were output by the model. So we're having the training data and then the novel output following it. Nay, nay, lording, answered Wolf. We know not how to call you lord or lady. We have lived too long in the forest and are now... Our first impressions of people are, in nine cases out of ten, mere spectacle reflections of the actuality of things. But they are impressions of something different and more... Yeah, and so it's possible both with speech and with music. And we are working to create a generative model for animal communication. So our senior researcher, Jin Yu Yu, has created um, one of these generative models for birdsong. And I'll play an example of a chiff chaff, which is a European songbird some of you may be familiar with. Um, the first two chirps within this are part of the training data and the rest was generated by the model. And so we are beginning to use these models, interacting with animals, uh, collaborating with some researchers at McGill University. Uh, we're working uh, with Dr. Logan James, who is a postdoc at McGill, and we're focused on zebra finches. And we've selected this species because, as many of you probably know, zebra finches are a well-understood model system. We know a lot about song acquisition and we understand that there's a sensitive learning period that is controlled both genetically and by um, social landscape. And we even know in great detail the neural architecture that's underpinning the acquisition of vocalizations, like in this graphic in the lower middle here. So because we understand so much already about zebra finch song, we want to start here and try to first address this question of can a generative model interact with an animal in a realistic way? And once we have achieved that, we hope to allow for many unstructured playbacks with uh, a computer model interacting or speaking with or having a back and forth with a bird. And we think that we can actually discover quite a bit from that. So by creating a call and response behavioral paradigm, 
and recording the bird's response, we expect that we'll be able to infer some of the rules that are governing syntax and uh, formation of songs and patterns and timing rules in these social interactions. And we might be able to identify certain features of vocalizations or particular calls that then influence behavior. Um, and I think a, a good analogy to explain this is thinking about ChatGPT. Um, many of us have probably had interactions with ChatGPT online through a text dialogue box, and that's almost like a playback for humans. So ChatGPT is a model that uh, presents like a human and it's very realistic sounding text and we will respond to it. And if we record um, all of the human responses, we can probably analyze that text and start to understand how our language is formed and maybe even something about the neural basis of language or how our brains work. So this is what we're hoping to get at within the coming years um, using generative models. So that was just a few examples of some of our ongoing work. We have many more collaborations um, that we don't have time to discuss today. If you have a data set or a study system or an idea that you'd like to discuss with ESP, we would love to work with you. Uh, here's a link to our website. Um, please get in touch and we're always ready to bring on new collaborators. And one last note for any other researchers and the audience who are studying interspecies communication. ESP has recently started working with the Experiment Foundation, and we are currently helping to um, put out a line of funding that is providing support for researchers um, in this area. And it's the uh, Experiment Foundation itself, their goal is to match researchers with donors who can help fill this funding gap with early stages of curiosity. So if you have a nascent project idea that you'd like to get off the ground, this grant would be well suited for you and we're funding projects up to $10,000. The applications are open now at experiment.com. Hmm. Awesome. So hopefully in listening to those case studies, it's inspired some ideation about how you may get started with machine learning. We've learned a lot over the last years working with dozens of collaborators, and we want to pass on what we've learned um, to the ethologists in the room. Um, what's a good way to start working with machine learning? Um, and we've, we're going to provide these on our GitHub and on our website, but just to sort of review them in brief, you know, consider hiring a machine learning researcher into your ethology lab. Um, join working groups or start a working group at your university that is looking at applications of machine learning in various disciplines outside of computer science. Um, start a machine learning office hours in your department, bringing in machine learning uh, students um, into your biology departments. Um, consider providing data to ma the machine learning departments, ecological data to your, your colleagues in different um, disciplines. And join online communities. You know, this is a great one. Uh, Interspecies IO has a Slack channel. There's also Wild Labs. We have our Discord. There's an AI for Conservation Slack. And um, you know, if you're a grad student, consider taking on a machine learning researcher as your co-advisor. Um, we also have learned a lot about how data can be um, collected and annotated and pre-processed and applied for machine learning. And we wanted to pass along those learnings to the broader field. And again, we're going to provide this information on our website. And, you know, good machine learning data sets has a lot of overlap with good documentation for biology. And here are some sort of key things that we would recommend around what you might annotate and what you might share. Um, we also have sort of highlighted two best practice data sets. One is Dan Stowell's uh, bird data set. Another is MuseDB18 for sound separation. 
these both articulate many of the attributes of documentation that we would recommend for those who make data, collect data. Um, and sort of lastly, if you, if we, we realizing the different reasons why one might share and not for publication and for IP protection and, and, and other concerns, but if you do feel comfortable sharing your data publicly, here's a few ways to get started. And um, again, we're going to share these recommendations with, with our colleagues in the field. And I guess the, the point I want to sort of bring in is like, we really want the tent of machine learning to be as broad as possible. So that way, ethologists are having these tools and are benefiting just as much as other fields, other in, in the industry, in academia, and in, um, and so we're thinking a lot about, you know, what are the incentives, motivations, focus, and values for the various stakeholders building machine learning? And we want to make sure that those who are focused on conservation biology, biodiversity, planetary health, have access to these tools and have a seat at the table and bring their findings and their um, perspectives to the conversation. You know, an interesting kind of like observation of the field at large is foundation models, which uh, there are many, and there's many more all the time, they are named for animals. Like nine out of 10 of them are named things like llama, alpaca, panda, GPT, sparrow, falcon, uh, chinchilla, gorilla, it goes on and on. It's a, it's a menagerie of animals. And yet um, ours is the only one that is and looking at animal communication systems and animal signals. And I think that's a, again, we want the field to become broader and we want to bring ethologists into this conversation and have machine learning be uh, something that benefits everyone. Um, and we realize that solving this problem of interspecies communication or deepening on our, our understanding is gonna require collaboration and communication across many, many different disciplines. And none of our work or the work of this field would not be possible without the advice and collaboration of, of you all in the, in the community who are working in ethology and neuroethology. And we're just, we're so grateful for the diversity of partners that we have and know that the essentiality of the bringing together of multiple disciplines I mean, even within our own team of AI research scientists, we come from a diversity of backgrounds and fields. And just a little plug, we are hiring. We are hiring a, um, a research director. And if you are interested, please go to our website um, and to learn more. Oh, I don't know what just, what just happened there. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, can you all see this slide? Cool. Um, lastly, I just want to, I would be remiss without mentioning um, something that's being discussed in the public discourse, which is around ethics and safety. And that is absolutely a concern and something we have a responsibility to be thinking about. And we want to ensure that we stakeholders, conservationists, wildlife biologists, field biologists, are working together to define an ethical framework and inspecting these models. And you know, some of the things we may want to contemplate together are how do we create um, unbiased models and balance in our training sets? You know, what are the requirements we're going to have in model performance? Should these models, their weights, and these data sets be openly available, or should we have some kind of gating or safeguards? And um, you know, we really look forward to being part of that conversation and bringing in as many stakeholders to contemplate these big questions. So, in in essence, I, I hope that um, you know we uh, understand the capability of these models. And there's this uh, there's this analogy that my co-founder Aza um, often references, which is the ability of machine learning to act as a sort of telescope or microscope. It enables us to, to see things that our human capabilities may, may not um, based on our physiology or our neurology. And 
you know, in, in that sense, it has the ability to detect meaning and unlock understanding. Um, it also has the ability to be a productivity multiplier in so many fields and industries, including ethology. And the discoveries that we are able to make as an interdisciplinary field may very well change how people relate to non-humans. But at the same time, um, I, I love this quote, you know, it is these multi-stakeholder, really complex challenges that we're faced with, things like climate change, require people. We're, you know, decision-making among human beings. And so it's really important that ethologists, animal welfare activists, conservation biologists, behavioral neuroscientists, naturalists, wildlife veterinarians, you know, those who are listening and care about science and change have access to these tools and are using them and creating the kinds of conversations and the ability to communicate in these multi-stakeholder, big, hairy, complex issues. Um, and so we really hope that uh, the field continues to build and we move towards being able to better listen and communicate with one another about these and maybe even bring in our other species on earth. Um, yeah, so, you know, we're we've come to the end here. Um, we're excited to answer some questions. Um, here's our contact information if you want to be in touch with us um, and follow along with our research, be part of our community on Discord. Um, please find us and, and connect. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for listening. And we're excited to, to have a discussion together. Awesome. Thank you so much, both Katie and Sarah. That was a really great, I think, overview and also a really great kind of follow-up to what we heard in 2020. So this is really, I think, going to be um, yeah, a great place for us to start a discussion. I do see many questions already popping up throughout the talk um, in your, um, sorry, in the chat throughout your talk. So I don't know if anybody would like to use the um, the hand button to ask a question, if anybody wants to jump in, if anybody is interested to start us off in the discussion. Would you like to finish um, sharing screen, Katie, and that way we can get everybody's... So you can, there's a raise hand button at the bottom if anybody would like to use that to ask a question. So we have Jeff who would like to ask a question. Would you like to kick us off, Jeff? Yeah, thank you guys. Um, awesome, fast paced, digestible information. Um, I'm gonna repeat a question I had, but I've seen other people follow up with it. And I thought Rod did a good job of kind of summarizing what I was saying, but there's a lot of assumptions about phonemes versus morphemes or when does a sound carry meaning and so if you could help us you know understand some of the assumptions around how you're tokenizing the sounds and what you're learning I guess over time and readjusting back to where there might be time scale meaning with certain species and frequency meaning and others so that's the general question okay. Thanks, that's a very good question. Um, how we're tokenizing sounds. So this, to go back to describing the foundation model that we mentioned, AVs, this is based on a Google model called BERT that was first published in 2018. And uh, that was trained on human speech. And um, that encoder model is taking human words and then creating some sort of uh, shrunken down, reduced dimensionality representation of them. So just like a few measurements. And we have fine tuned that model to train it with animal sounds. So we are now expecting it to pick up on the different types of variations, such as pitch contours or, or different time resolution and change over time. Um, that we're seeing in different taxa. Uh, so the tokenization is happening using that BERT architecture, the, the same way it's happening with human speech. What um, an, an open problem really, is, and a really good question is how we are <clears throat> defining a word and the unit, <clears throat> the unit of analysis. And so at the moment, we are using our human discretion to 
to determine this in many cases. Like, where does a single beluga call start and end? Um, we're limited by our own perceptual abilities and what we can hear and, and see in the spectrogram. And so that does leave some room for error. Uh, the way that we refine this is continuing to collect more and more data and, and transform the data or apply manipulations to see if we get different results, and then to do validations with animals with uh, when possible. So in a very controlled environment, um, in a way that doesn't put animals at risk to sometimes uh, do playbacks or, or measure their reaction to signals to discern whether or not they do contain the meaning that we suspect. So this is an ongoing process and, and one of the biggest challenges in the area. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. I think that played a few questions in the chat, so that's great. Darcy, would you like to ask your question? Sure. Um, so our lab uh, studies vocal communication in an aquatic and urine frog, Xenopus. Um, it's a very old species, a group of species. There are about 29 species. I have about 19 of them in the lab. And uh, we study mostly courtship songs. Um, and the songs themselves have distinctive spectral features. Um, and the spectral features are due to, entirely due to their vocal organ, their larynx. So they developed a, a quite novel mechanism of producing sound underwater that does not involve airflow. And each, in a male, each sound pulse includes two dominant frequencies. And uh, genetically related groups of frogs, frogs in a clade, for example, uh, while they won't share those two frequencies, they will share the ratio. And the ratio are uh, our harmonic musical intervals. So this was actually discovered by a student who was a musician. Um, it's in an eLife paper. Kwong Brown is the first author. So I'd be very interested in collaborating with somebody to look through our entire library of underwater sounds, which is extremely extensive, um, and see if we could make that database available widely. And I'm particularly interested to determine whether there are acoustic signals of evolutionary divergence and convergence across these species. Um, and these are also species that form new species by hybridizing. So the ploidy levels in these animals go all the way up to dodecaploid. So the other part of our work has been identifying the portions of the genome that are responsible um, for the different patterns of the song and the different acoustic features. Um, and with respect to the patterns, we have mapped the entire neural circuit for both the sound production and sound reception, and identified one particular kind of cell whose intrinsic rhythmicity is responsible for the intrinsic rhythmicity of the songs themselves. Um, and so we've done that in a couple of species, it could be done in more. So just to let you know that those data are out there, um, we've been using uh, various machine learning approaches to uh, characterize the behavior of females these are hybrid females towards the calls of either parental species. Um, this is an area I think that's really quite ripe for machine learning approaches. And uh, we're gonna be working some on it this summer as a group. And if anybody wants to collaborate, just let me know. Um, dbk3 at columbia.edu. Wow, thank you. That, that sounds so ripe for increasing our understanding, um, especially because you have the genetic data as well. So we'd really possibly be able to tease apart the different effects that are shaping these vocalizations. So thank you so much. Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, okay, so we have the next question coming from, well, I, the, I think the only dog in the group today. So this is, hey, this is amazing. It's... You might not be the only dog, I'm not sure. <laughs> Uh, so it's it's fitting because uh, well, my name's Propo. I built a Saramog app to talk to dogs. But um, the question is that we tried to use AVs and the results didn't get us um, the kind of embedding that you showed earlier. So I don't know if there have been recent updates, but um, 
we ended up having to use uh, something like efficient yet net outside of that with our spectral. Uh, but we have the, well, by the end of the summer, we'll have the largest data set of barks with uh that are labeled from people with what their dogs are saying both seen labeled and uh seen unlabeled so we've done a lot of inference and we're really close to doing the translation um so but what we were finding is that with dogs specifically you also have to train them to expand their vocabulary it's not just in uh inherent so i was wondering if you see that with other animals or if this is something that's unique because their companion animals and they're communicating with us. Um, and yeah, if there's any other kind of observations, but yeah, we spent um, the last year collecting data and building models. And so we, we've tried out a lot of different uh, approaches, but um, what it turned out seemed to, to work the best were like dumber models. And so the next question is like, it, our foundational model is really the right approach with a very limited data set that uh, that you're getting, especially that's unlabeled, where a lot of foundational models are built with like massive data sets that are incre uh, are high labeled and um, and uh, have gone through a lot of like human uh, in the loop uh, feedback. Um, uh, that's such a good question. There is a lot in there. Um, I, I'll start at the beginning. Uh, the first one about your comment about using AVs and getting different results. Uh, one thing that I glossed over when I was presenting our results from the beluga whale calls and that rotating point cloud is that I po did some post-processing of that foundation model output. I, I ran a random forest uh, on it, and I was able to get the similarity between calls using that. And um, that's some code that will be on our GitHub soon. So that would al allow for inferring those types of relationships um, if the model output is, is useful for your analysis. And uh, also, I, I guess what you're saying is that in dogs, you might need a, a different approach. And I don't think we've worked yet with species that have acquired vocalizations uh, through interactions with humans. I believe we we have some of that data, but we've not done thorough analyses. So this is the kind of area that we'd love to dig into more. And you mentioned having a, a data set uh, that's ready to be analyzed. And I think if you're up for working with our research team, we could uh, iterate on which models are most appropriate for that, because it could be that the sort of variation you're looking for between signals is not uh, perhaps what our foundation model is best at discerning. Sounds good, yeah. Um, well, yeah, we, we could talk offline about the rest, but yeah, curious about like why foundational models when, when we're uh, data set limited as well. Yeah, um, I guess foundation models are expected to work best when we have a lot of examples that look like the data we're going to encounter in the wild. Exactly. Uh, and um, this is this is going to be a hard problem when we're studying animal communication, because all of our best foundation models for human speech, we have millions of examples of pretty much the same kind of signal. So we're getting really yeah. high resolution, like thousands and thousands of examples of the same word. And I mean, within... we found whisper is bad at translating um, when people are speaking, and it, it makes mistakes. Like the error word count is like. A, a very, very high. I don't know exactly, but it's it isn't very good. And they've trained on six hundred forty hours of or six hundred forty thousand hours, I think, of human speech. So that's why I was like, is a foundational model the right approach at this point? Yeah, and maybe some unsupervised techniques would do better. I guess is the idea, where we're not relying completely on a really good training data set. Yes. Yeah. And and, and smaller models as well. Yeah, what kind of dumb models worked well on on your sounds? Oh, I mean, we went way back. We did FBMs, KNNs. We did a really, really old uh, um, neural network. Like it's like very, it, it's just whatever works. I mean, we have to build a commercial product, right? And so, um, so yeah, we'll have the first dog communication thing within the next couple of months. But yeah, it uh, it took a lot of like going back to the basics because there's so much that. We're, we're not able to capture from the signal with neural networks because they oftentimes will 
just categorize a bark and won't be able to distinguish it between barks and an embedding. So we had to create a lot to identify the differences in the, in the characteristics that could allow us to identify between even different dogs. And like the embeddings that were out there don't, don't do that. So we spent a lot of time on just like simple problems. I guess. Um, one thing that's relevant is that there's a idea in the machine learning community called the bitter lesson. And the idea behind that is that models will continue to get better the more data we train them with. And as much as we'd like to have another solution, we this is kind of a bottleneck. And um, if we get enough data, there, there's a belief that we will eventually be able to solve the problem. Um, and in speech analysis, it seems like to get to those uh, unsupervised or few shot approaches that work well, we've still needed to go through that hoop of first building a foundation model with lots and lots of data. So I, I think this is something that's um, up for debate. It's an active area of research, but uh, it seems as though getting all the data first and building a big foundation model is the classic first step. Great, thank you for that. That was really fascinating. And I think we have a lot of uh, dog lovers in our community. So this always brings a lot of interest. Um, Jonas, would you like to ask your question next? Uh, sure. Um, regarding what you what you guys just talked about, um, what is your opinion on the the chances and, and problems in, in supervised versus unsupervised machine learning in this context? Um, I I'm a big fan of unsupervised approaches for repertoire discovery because they're going to allow us to find things that we're not looking for. And uh, so I think we're going to have to use both in parallel. Um, with supervised training, we have to make some decisions that we could easily be wrong about, like determining, determining categories of signals. Um, whereas in unsupervised approaches, um, we don't have to have that a priori set in stone. Um, but I, I'm a big believer in, in going back and forth and figuring out which path is giving us the best answers and, um, and then validating those through uh, controlled, um, ethically done uh, interactions with animals um, to see that our predictions are actually matching reality. So in your, um, in your beluga um, experiment example, um, were there um, any unsupervised parts? Did you did you uh, go back and forth as you as you said? Yeah, that <clears throat> that analysis was done using a supervised model, I guess our our foundation model, um, to first take feature measurements, and then the unsupervised part of that was the post processing uh, random forest decision tree that created the classes based on the model measurements. And uh, so, so it was a combination of both approaches and the random forest is a favorite of mine because you can have classes of different size. You can have a category with two calls and a category with 200 and it allows for that and it um, controls for other biases in your data. Um, so yeah, that's an example of combining the two of them in order to better understand the communication system. Yeah, thanks so much. Thank you. Mark, would you like to ask your question? We don't hear you yet, Mark. I think you're still on mute. Okay. Fantastic. Uh, <laughs> I'm very interested to hear more about the extent to which the models that you've been talking about have the capacity to take into account uh, environmental context data and historical context data that can be correlated with the uh, data with the vocalization data to help understand what the animals are actually talking about. Is that clear? Or... Yeah, um, Katie can comment on this too after me. Um, we are we're aiming to do that largely through associating 
text notes and other environmental measurements with audio signals or, or the other communication signals we're measuring. So uh, these clip models that go between modalities, like when we write a text description and an image is generated uh, by building those mappings. And so uh, if we're thinking about the uh, social context or behavioral context of two individuals interacting, ideally, um, this is, this is where the power of researchers and intense observations come in. A researcher could write a description of two individuals having an interaction and mention um, their relationship, the fact that a predator was just there 10 minutes ago, the fact that they had yeah. some kind of dispute two weeks ago. And we can do a text analysis using some of these uh, machine learning tools that are already out in the world and associate those text features with the vocalizations that then happen. Um, so that's that's our current approach to uh, associating context and then linking things like GPS measurements, climate data, um, anything else we can get our hands on and hoping that our models are power enough, powerful enough to build these mappings across modalities and then uh, give us predictions based on that. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Because that's an awful lot of data, isn't it? I was uh, asked on the basis of the work by Consular Botchikov with the um, uh, um, prairie dogs, uh, where they changed one environmental variable at a time and uh, the painstaking work that was involved in that. Um, it seems like uh, the models would need a huge capacity. Yeah, and that work has been so essential to understanding exactly what kind of models we need uh, and and all of that work like a, a key lesson from it has been that a behavioral interaction is never just what we're observing within the moment there are days months years of context behind it um that yeah. are loaded in to every interaction we're observing yeah thank you Great, I see, I don't know, Con, I think you're you're in the room. Yes, there you are. So we often have, have this reference. So this is great. Thanks for being here again, Con. And I don't know if you want to make a comment on this at all. If you thanks, Kate. I just want to say that I think it's really wonderful stuff that you guys at Earth Species Project are doing. I think these are the building blocks of eventually getting us to the point where we can understand what animals are communicating. As you know, I talk about animal languages. I think that these will form the building blocks of understanding that animals have discrete languages of their own. And my hope is that down the road, we not only will be able to understand those languages, but also be able to talk to animals so that eventually we can get to the point where we will see animals as sentient thinking beings that we can have partnerships with and not consider them as creatures to be exploited for our own uses. So anyway, I think you're doing wonderful stuff and I applaud what you're doing. Awesome. Thanks, Con. I don't know if anybody else has any questions. We have the, the chat is on fire. So I think we have lots of discussion happening there, lots of potential collaborations popping up. So this is really, really wonderful. Does anybody else have any last minute or, or final questions that they wanted to bring up and discuss while we have the team here? I think, could I just maybe raise one uh, question that came from the group? It's in the chat and it's from Antoine, who is uh, joining us. He's one of our art um, or artists in the community. And I think this is a really interesting question that he brings, which is around, you know, how maybe artists can get involved in collaborations here and if there is an opportunity for that to happen. So I don't know if Antoine, you want to ask this question, but I think it's nice to bring this. It brings a different perspective to the discussion that we have today. I don't know if you want to comment.
I see you have your mic off, but we don't hear you. Hello. Oh yeah, now well, we hear you. Sorry, the camera is not really working, but no, it's uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for picking up on on the question. Yeah, it's it's kind of a very general question. I've been really interested in uh, through my practice in sound and music in in um, animal communication, um, and obviously my background is you know there's a little bit of coding involved and sort of the, as a general cultural. <laughs> into into using these tools in composition but not to the level i've been hearing today in machine learning and so generally as an artist i'm just really interested in tapping into the subject to question it and share some of the beauty of it and the importance of it uh, as as con was mentioning um that you know it's really has your, your work is amazing for, for the same reason that we're explaining i think that they they sculpt new relationship with other beings and uh, other species and, and hopefully improve <laughs> our relation with the environment in general and so yeah as an artist i'm just interested in creating work and and thinking of art and science collaboration that could communicate some of this research uh, which a lot of the public doesn't know about um and yeah so my question is is whether uh, you've already or you are maybe collaborated at, at esp with artists or if this is something that you envisage in the future and 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 how would you see it and uh as, as part of maybe your your work more maybe on the communication side or, or the sort of broader re reflection side that is a great question um <clears throat> uh the Artists that um, captured the image at the start of our um, at the start of our presentation, his name is Kerry Wilk. He's a photographer, um, and images and storytelling and art have such a powerful way of connecting with human beings, um, who, like we said, are going to be necessary for us to collaborate and communicate amongst each other in order to solve these massive problems. And so certainly we believe that art is going to have a very big role in this, in making the science accessible and driving um, change among uh, sort of social and political decision-making and the relationship that people have with um, each other and other species. I would say um, we're deeply inspired by artists, but we're in our nascent stages of our own communications work and trying to build capacity to have relationships. But I think it's for sure something that we view as essential, not just the science itself, but making sure that the science is accessible to as many people, as many stakeholders as possible. And like I said, art is gonna be a huge avenue in doing that um, to drive that much needed change, um, urgent change for all of us. Um, and so we, you know, we love to be in touch. We may not have the capacity to, um, to engage and participate in, in work right now, but it's certainly something we hope for in the future and would love to just build relationships where they are. So please be in touch and join our community and, and reach out to us. Um, that would be wonderful. Thanks very much for your answer. It sounds great, thanks. Great, thank you. Um, we have another question from Serge. Would you like to ask your question? Yes. Hi, can you hear me? Yes? Okay, yes, so can. I would like to thank ESP for this great presentation and amazing work that uh, you're doing. Uh, I finally understand what ESP is all about. And I just would like to have a narrow question on what is uh, ESP doing with uh, uh, Dr. Aubin uh, and the Bilugas of the St. Lawrence, uh, which I've been following for over 50 years and from far. And uh, I think it's a primary species where we could have a real interaction with a smart uh, animal that could actually speak to us, that also may be interested in speaking to us. So is there any more work and what, what are you planning to do with Dr. Aubin or, or any other Bilugas uh, researcher? Um, with the presented example, we are aiming to help the researchers publish results showing that these analyses can um, mimic or replicate human abilities in discerning between calls, and then that'll be applied more broadly, hopefully to their entire database. And um, this is part of a 
researcher's PhD thesis. So she'll be carrying on this work for, for many years. And she is part of a conservation group that is more broadly trying to implement policies and uh, change human behavior within the St. Lawrence River. And to so she's aiming to communicate her findings and then um, take action by helping to put rules in place that will um, protect the population. So ESP's role in this has been supporting her in the analysis and then helping to get the results out to the public. And um, in the future, we may also start working with the conservation groups themselves to uh, implement plans based on our findings. Uh -huh. So you're not planning more communication research with uh, the belugas? Um, we're hoping to. I think it'll depend on uh, what data they have available and um, their capacity as well. OK, thank you. All right, thank you. Jeff, would you like to ask another question? Okay. Yeah, thank you for giving me the time. Um, I live in the West, uh, Western Rockies uh, near Yellowstone Park, and there is kind of an ongoing renewed battle against predators, whether it's now the grizzly bear debate is going to hit the national stage, wolves, cougars, I mean, it's constant. Um, I already know of some people in let's call it the hunting camera trap world, and, and I hunt, so just to be clear, I'm I'm not an anti-hunter, but and I'm also not a pro predator killer. So set those motions aside for a second. But I already know of people who are building AI detectors with camera traps um, that are already thinking through how do we do vocalization prompting to lure in a predator, then detect it visually, right? And then text a message and you're you're done, right? Um, one of the problems I see in this AI space is partly the, the race and the war about commoditizing hardware, not the software. And the conservation world keeps producing this next new great sensing, remote sensing device that can do audio context plus, and we don't get it at scale, right? So we use the same cheap crap that comes you know, from years ago that file name things like DCSN. And so I'm, and you guys have a big who's who funding base at Earth Species. You can go to your website and see it. And yet it seems like we're taking a Microsoft approach of let a bunch of other people solve the hardware problem and we'll be good at software. When we, sh if we're gonna win some of these wars, we need to take an Apple approach and let's consolidate hardware and software into some solutions that are going to do good. Sorry for the sermon. Anything you can do to help with those of us in the field would be great. Yeah, I think I uh, love your question and love the issues you're raising, Jeff, as well as helping uh, broaden the scope of this challenge to it, the tools that we in the front lines of conservation and in the field of, in the multi-stakeholder field of interacting with non-human species, it is, uh, it, hardware is a key part of the um, entire collection process of data and how the, those stakeholders are diverse in their incentives, um, diverse in their motivations. And so we have a responsibility as technologists to consider um, what, those, uh, what those incentives and what those value systems are. So when we are innovating and we're thinking about supporting uh, you know, our, our aims of changing our relationship with non-human species, we're taking into account you know, the unintended consequences or the bad, what we might judge as bad actors in this space. Um, and as I raised in the earlier in the presentation, this is a very big part of our work is sort of ethics and safety um, for machine learning models. Um, and whether they're in the cloud or on board in the hardware, it's important to think about, um, about these things with key stakeholders like you all um, and making sure that everyone is educated and can communicate about this so that we might come to conclusions that um, we feel are, are in, aligned with our principles. Um, and human wildlife conflict and de-escalation right now, as we, as we know, is sort of 
it's driven by a certain set of values where animals can be destroyed or translocated um, sort of in this in, in a very specific way, especially in the West. So uh, changing those underlying social values around how we relate to animals is also very important in addition to um, the uh, technological advances we might have about understanding them better. Yeah, I mean, just as a quick follow up, there are lots of positive things going on, right? There are different value systems, but what I'm getting at is democratizing sensing in hardware for the common person who lives out in the field, whether it's a rancher who owns a large landscape and you know is for coexistence, but has to deal with poaching, whether it's a person in Nepal who's for tigers, but has to go into the forest to gather wood and doesn't want to get killed. And I just see us failing. We have ivory tower sensing devices that the few get access to, right? And they produce all the data. And you guys crank it out and create some good AI models. But the democratization, and I'm not talking about bird feeder images. I'm talking about audio and visual camera traps, 360 degrees. Um, we know how to build them. You know, they're in the commercial market but we just don't seem to have the interest from the big donors to say, how do we do this so that we can help people do conservation in the landscape? Because there are plenty of people who would like a gunshot detector that triangulates down to the location and they know a wolf howl just came through. I mean, it can be used for security and policing as well. So anyway, again, sorry for the sermon. I hope there's other people interested in this and we can keep the dialogue going. Yeah, no, I love this. And I, um, coming from the remote sensing uh, and animal born sensor space, drawing down those costs and making it ex accessible to stakeholders across the entire landscape is really important. And I love that you bring that up, Jeff. And I don't know if we still have Neil Gershenfeld in the, the room, but I think, you know, the open source hardware community that comes from the Fab Lab world would be somewhere that would be very interesting to have these kinds of discussions. I don't know um, if anybody is aware of any projects happening in that space, but that could be somewhere to start that conversation as well or to continue it, Jeff. So thank you very much. I think we we have almost got to the halfway or half, a half hour past um, the hour. So I think that we might, um, in respect for everybody's time on a weekend, wrap it up there. I think this has been one of um, our best attended lectures. So this is really exciting. And it seems to be a field that is really piquing the interest of lots of different people who really come together in this field of the interspecies internet and what we're doing in terms of bringing ourselves and, and our work closer to the world around us. So the chat is very, very full. So please, um, if you do want a copy of that, you can, you can email us. Um, at info at interspecies.io and I will send that over to you. Um, that's available for anyone. And please keep in mind that you can always join our Slack and keep this conversation going. I shared the link to that um, before in the chat and you can jump on there and find the people that you've been talking to during this. So yeah, I hope that everybody has uh, enjoyed this session today. And thank you again for joining us, Sarah and Katie. This has been wonderful to get an update on everything you're doing. And we hope to see more from you soon. Thanks, everyone, and have a wonderful weekend.